3D printing is a fun and practical tool to provide high detail, rapidly formed, perfect plastic parts every time. Except when it doesn't. Anyone who prints regularly will generate considerable waste plastic from supports, failed, and broken prints. I am not an exception. The plastic already melts and forms into different shapes by design. So what is stopping you from going backwards to filament again? Apparently $680 or 18000 At the $680 price range, you get 2.9 stars, uh, 10 to 26 inches a minute, where it is not very good, doesn't work as advertised. Well, I guess it's orange, which is all it takes to get five stars. Do not buy overpriced, can't wait to look at the other one, and junk. The other one is the price of a small car, or cheaper if you buy more parts. There's a three grand one, which does about 10 times more throughput than the $680 one, but it's gotta be cheaper to just build one myself, and I could probably do better than that Amazon one. So I bought a power supply, a motor speed controller, some AC cabling, which I've never done before, so learning that should be fun, and other various electronics. Some quick Googling reveals a standard American outlet has three ports, a white neutral, a black line, and a green ground, which would not have been my first guess, so I'm glad I looked it up. Thinking through the wiring a little, the AC source on the wall is connected to the corresponding spots on the power supply, and then wiring is connected to the DC voltage outputs. The power supply itself seems way too complicated to draw the diagram for, so we'll just appreciate the magic that goes on inside there. Then, the connected motor controller has a knob for adjusting speed and a three-way switch for forward, off, and reverse, which I imagine looks something like this internally. The output of that then gets wired to the motor, which, with any luck, shouldn't burn my apartment down. I mean, should, should power, power the motor, yeah. Forward control and speed adjustment works as intended, with a decent low end speed and a quick response to input. Directional control switches quickly and easily. Coupling that to a used two inch diameter, 17 inch long auger screw looks something like this. The heater circuit, however, is a bit more complicated and does not work when wired like this. Instead, and shout out to my coworkers for helping me through this electrical challenge, the AC power should be wired in series with a 5 amp fuse to protect your house and a thermal fuse to prevent fire, again, to protect your house, into one side of the solid state relay with the other side connecting to the heater. The other half of the SSR should be wired to the corresponding ports of the PID controller and the thermal couple is attached as shown. The wiring to the heater has to be high temp and the heater should be grounded to prevent you from electrocuting yourself. It is worth noting that the thermal fuse is conductive and setting it bare onto the heater and then applying ground will trip your outlet, which is bad. Luckily, JB Weld is heat resistant to over 200 degrees C, is thermally conductive, and is electrically isolative. A fiberglass sleeving further prevents short circuiting. Of course, if you don't believe me, like I didn't, you probably want to make sure this all works and that the fuse will still blow if it overheats. After a few milliseconds of rational brainstorming, I came up with this contraption. A spare disc of metal sitting on my electric stovetop with the insulated and potted fuse would then be heated while I could track the temperature of the system with the thermocouple. Then I could use a multimeter to check the continuity of the fuse while only burning myself considerably. Letting that heat, while definitely not speeding up the footage, reveals that the fuse loses conductivity at around 250 degrees C which is 35 degrees higher than advertised, but it's still low enough to probably be safe. If that didn't make sense, let me simplify it for you. New fuse, beep. Cooked fuse, no beep. I anticipate needing a second heating source and want to try to extrude out of a hole close to the desired diameter of the filament. So I began ruining a perfectly good 0.4 millimeter hot end to make it a nearly 1.75 millimeter hot end. I then poorly wired and programmed it with an Arduino and a MOSFET, which is more clearly shown in this diagram. A MOSFET is basically a switch that you can control with an electrical signal, allowing me to turn on and off the heating element to try to regulate temperature. 
So now that I have a DC motor with variable control, a heating circuit, and a hot end, when I jam it all together, I feel like I'm missing something. Ah yes, the mechanical bits to actually handle the molten plastic. Cue this aluminum monstrosity. Measuring nearly two feet long and weighing over five pounds, this sucker should surely raise my electric bill. The idea is as follows. As plastic enters through this top port via hopper, the rotation of the screw will propel the plastic particles forward towards the heating element. Along their journey, heat will slightly weaken and liquefy the material into a thick and viscous slurry. That slurry will be compressed and then extruded out this nozzle into the rough dimensions of filament. I unfortunately don't have a CNC, so I'll have to outsource the parts. And uh, $558? Before I place that order, let's double check dimensions and such. With everything fitting and the parts moving as planned in the one half, let's print the other half just to be sure. The best part is that, if this works, I can just recycle this prototype. I think the idea of the $558 was getting to me because I felt the need to simulate particle movement before I was ready to commit to this purchase. And I had some cereal lying around that me and my infinite wisdom thought would be a good parallel to molten plastic. Yeah, I don't really know what I'm doing at this point either. It does seem to have worked though, moving all the cereal to the front of the barrel. The strawberries seem to have gummed it up, but who even cares at this point? I'll just bite the bullet and shell out the money. Less than two weeks later, this gorgeous hunk of metal arrived at my doorstep. I'm sure the barrel shape and drug cartel looking packaging was a blast for the customs officer who had to let this package through to the country. Thankfully the big screw fits nicely in this thing I can't believe I bought. And with some quick movie magic, the thing is mostly assembled. Firing up the laser cutter to slice out a base to hold everything. and speed printing a motor mount to try to prevent this thing from torsioning itself apart. With these parts, we can complete our wiring diagram with the mechanical portion, and provide a short assembly montage bringing it all together. some of this heavy-duty insulation, which is known to the state of California to cause cancer. Luckily, I don't live there, so it's safe. No, but seriously, when handling this forbidden cotton candy, gloves and face masks are a good idea. To limit how much fiberglass dust this generates, I'm wrapping the outer face in high-temperature Kapton tape. It will also act as a barrier, so I can, in theory, safely pick it up without risk of skin irritation. Popping it onto the only surface in my apartment that won't immediately burst into flames, and after thoroughly checking the continuity of the ground connections, I was confident enough that it was safe. It's been about seven minutes. I think the issue is the location of the thermal couple. I think it's hotter than it actually is. I want to move it to one of the open holes. Uh, so let's test emergency shutoff. 
great. Move the thermal couple from this extra hole, which isn't really an extra hole, uh, to bolt back into Connecticon. So this hole up here, which was mistapped, so just put it in there. Plug it back in. Turn it on. Let's see if that works better. Okay, so it's heating up at about a tenth of a degree a second. I do want to check to see how accurate that temperature is though. So let's put some uh, plastic against the metal, see if it's melting. It is definitely warm. No melting yet, so we're going to let it keep going. It's been about 8 minutes. It's been 26 minutes. About 30 minutes in. Okay, we're at 86. I want to try feeding in some material and just see what happens. Okay, it's clearly not hot enough, so I'm going to turn that off. We're at about 52 minutes. We are at an hour and 17 minutes in. We're at an hour and 40 minutes. We're at two hours and 11 minutes. We're at two hours and 40 minutes. We're at three hours and eight minutes. Okay, the failure point here seems to be that buckler. In an attempt to fix it, I shattered the coupling. completely. So that's going to pretty much end the test for today. First, let's swap the broken flex coupler for this coupling behemoth. Secondly, let's look at the heating. To melt the plastic, we need to reach temperatures around 180 centigrade. Pulling the temperature values from the timestamps gives you this graph, which plateaus at about 135 centigrade. That issue likely comes from the fact that I only have 120 volt power in my apartment and the heater optimally runs on 240 volt. Looking at theory, Ohm's law relates current and resistance to voltage and Watt's law, or the definition of a watt, relates the current and voltage to the power generated. Combining the two provides useful simplifications. Plugging in the rated values for the heater reveals that the band provides 144 ohms of resistance. That resistance is roughly constant regardless of the voltage. Using that value and the 120 volt input reveals that the heater is only providing one fourth of its possible power. That means that the heater would heat about four times faster with 240 volt. I mean, there are heat loss considerations, but we're just going to neglect that because I don't feel like doing the math. Doing some crude quadrupling of the temperature increasing for the known empirical values reveals that 240 volt would not only allow me to reach the temperatures, but would get me there in around 20 minutes. Luckily, $80 can buy me out of this problem, and the wiring is pretty simple. And done. It's been two minutes. And it is accelerating quickly. We're at four minutes. Considerably faster than last time. We're at seven minutes and we're already over a hundred. It's been 12 minutes. We're at 14 minutes and we've passed 150C. We're very close to temperature. Let's get the nozzle in the shot. 177, I'm going to give it some power. See if we see any Everything degree. seems to be working as it should. The heater reached temperature almost exactly when the quick math said it would. The motor is spinning and thoroughly coupled. I can feed plastic and see it liquefying as I put it in. Adjusting the temperature up and down didn't seem to change anything. Eventually, smoke appeared. It wasn't the electronics or a fire, so that only leaves that I wasn't properly melting the filament. I raised the temperature, which really only made it worse. And meanwhile, the motor began getting quite hot, trying to push plastic that just refused to move. 
I eventually realized it was probably clogged in the nozzle, so I tried to clear the jam with paperclip, which only burned me considerably. The next day, after it had cooled down, a post-mortem revealed that the thermal couple to the secondary heater came loose and likely caused the heater to rail at max power, endlessly confused as to why it wasn't getting hotter, which caused it to cook the filament into likely toxic fumes. It does seem to have extruded to that point. all the bolts out. This is completely stuck. I'm going to try hitting it. Oh no. Oh, leverage. Oh, that didn't sound good. Cracked it. That's what it looks like. So here's the inside of the top, if you're wondering. Pretty good. And this is just solid plastic. Which is crazy. You can see there's just a molten pile there. So this is definitely working. It actually mapped the mold. And there's a little bit of extrusion. So it's definitely just an issue with the end cap. Which is a great sign. With my confidence raised and spirits lifted, I figured my hard work deserved a nice protein shake. It has a bit more lactic acid than I like in my drinks, but it'll do. In all seriousness though, D3D printing helps the recycler get a more even supply of material that should be a smaller load on the auger motor. With our findings, we can update the schematic for the last time by removing the secondary heater and end cap. The end cap removed. Let me see if we can get any extrusion. So we can give this about 20 minutes to heat up and I will check back in when stuff starts melting. Get very close to temperature. I'm going to turn on the motor. And we are getting extrusion. In about two minutes, we produced three grams of filament, which equates to about five inches per minute at nominal diameter, which was at a considerably low motor RPM, meaning it can likely do a few times better. How do we turn this unusable string of PLA into actual filament, though? Well, we have the extruder done. We may need to reintroduce the secondary hot end, and then we need a cooling system, a measurement system that informs a polar slash reeler how fast to spin, to load a spooler, which all together needs to generate consistent filament of a 1.75 millimeter diameter, plus or minus about a tenth of a millimeter. That fun will have to wait for next video, so subscribe so you don't miss it. See ya! Turns out I couldn't beat the Amazon price, but I have confidence it will be better, even if I don't end up making it orange.